Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is Richard Benuli. Today we have Dr. Frank Shostak and Ira Harris. Frank is currently with AAS Economics, Applied Economics, uh, Applied Austrian Economics, and has more than 35 years experience as a market economist, central bank analyst, and builder of large scale macroeconomic models. He's published in the Asian Wall Street Journal, the Wa Washington Times, the Australian Financial Review, and the Journal of European Political Science. He served as economist and market strategist for MF Global Australia and head of the economic department at the Standard Bank in Johannesburg, South Africa. Ira is an independent trader, hedge fund manager, global macro consultant trading foreign currencies, equities, bonds, and commodities for over 40 years. He was also CME director from 1997 to 2003 and a stint most recently. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is always a great pleasure. Great. I thought we'd begin with uh, uh, your general view, Frank, on the uh, e the global economy and the financial markets. What what your current thoughts are? Well, you know, like uh, when when you say global economy, it's 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 how global is global. But I, I would just confine myself to the Western world, uh, namely United States, Europe, and perhaps we'll discuss a little bit Japan, and uh, we we may also says a few a few words about China. Now, as far as the uh, U.S. economy is concerned, I'm 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 not uh, I'm uh, I'm I basically reckon that uh, it's uh, it's runs a hell of a risk, not because everybody agrees on that, but there's a massive risk that uh, the U.S. U.S. economy could be in serious troubles, and the reason being uh, not not so many not so much. Uh, in so-called indicators or whatever, it's got something to do with the, uh, the, the what I call the process of wealth generation. Uh, this process was uh, has been still is on under pressure, uh, was weakened significantly, and uh, and as a result of reckless uh, monetary policies of the central bank, the Fed, and also reckless fiscal policies of the United States government. Uh, all this remains intact, and uh, and I think we uh, reached the stage where the uh, consequences or the results of, of these reckless policies uh, are manifested in terms of the what I would call on the on the company level net worth of the company called the United States of America is uh, is starting to shrink, and and uh, which which basically amounts to, you can say, uh, it's close to bankruptcy. So the American economy is really on the, in a bankrupt state, state and uh, it will be very difficult to revive it. it, it uh, it's it's uh, very similar to what we, America experienced and the Western world experienced during the 30s. You know? And uh, so uh, the moment the pool of, uh, pool of wealth, or I call it pool of savings, uh, starting to uh, contract, uh, it's uh, various, various uh, fiscal and monetary policies that's, uh, that create illusion that the governments and central banks can grow the economy. Uh, turns out that they really fail because there's nothing to move any longer. There, there's, there, there's no more wealth to move. And, and that's the situation I, I'm afraid we are right now in America and the rest of the world also. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And your thoughts, Ira? No, I, I you know, I know in uh, Dr. Shasek's background, 
and his deep work with the uh, Van Mises Institute and his work on- uh, I, I, I cannot hear you properly. Oh, let me, let me try again. So knowing Dr. Shostak's work through, Von, through the Mises Institute and his um, deep knowledge of Austrian economics, so everything he says is a good takeoff point for us because, you know, I, I think what the Austrians bring best to the, to the realm of global macro, and I believe this since I'm in, university, in graduate school in the 70s, is the understanding of debt and the impact of debt upon the entire global system, especially in a, in a fiat currency world. You know, we're used to it. Everybody can demean the gold standard all they want because it did have a much more powerful impact upon liquidation crises, as I would call them. So I, I think this is a really good place to take off. And especially, into, I've read four articles today about the dollar and how everybody has gotten the dollar wrong. But I'm bearish on the dollar. I think there's a short-term um, movement into dollars here, but that's, to me, emblematic of how much global debt there is in the world that was foisted upon the world by the policies of the of the central banks. And especially because we had Bernanke who feared deflation more than anything else. So he brought that upon us. And I'm not saying that QE1 was wrong. I'm not, a, I think it was right because he wanted to prevent the liquidation of the financial system. But everything after that is really uh, subject to debate. And now we have the Europeans who have, um, mastered uh, what Bernanke and Yellen brought. You, you're fading it's away. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, your 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 voice is getting uh, gets, breaks down occasionally, but anyhow, uh, yeah, I, my, I, I I got you. I got I got I got I got. Yeah, I got it, but but the dollar rally to me is because of the huge amount of debt. So people are running as the Fed is raising interest rates, and others, of course, are going the same way. But if you're carrying denominated debt with a rallying dollar, it's a two pronged uh, squeeze. On the global financial system, but I'll, I'll I'll stop there. But I and then I'll we'll pick up with Dr. Shasta. Look, you know, I, I well, first of all, I, I, I you know, like the Austrian school, it's a wide school, right? So I uh, I would like actually like to to be known as follower of Mises and Rothbard, not all the other Austrians, because there's, there there are many other Austrians that I don't exactly in agreement. Put it this way. Okay. So I'm. I like to be. I'm actually Mizesian and Rosbardian to, to begin with. Now uh, the the nice thing about those two guys that they they were actually very much macro. They 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 were opposing macro view. They were they they, they were th saying that we need to the economy is about individuals, not about collectives, and and there's no such a thing overall production like. The, the way they portray GDP as if somebody, some, some the, the whole nation produced certain things, and there was one supreme leader that over over oversaw them. That's that's uh, socialism, communism. No, now as far as debt is concerned, that you mentioned about the debt, yeah, debt debt uh, could be a problem, provided provided it was issued without any backup from savings. Now, if uh, things were saved, let's say I saved. Uh, Ten dollars, right? And uh, I decided to lend it to you. That, uh, that, 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 that this is fine, right? This is all picked up. And if you squander this uh, ten dollars and you you're not in a position to to let to return to me again, uh, the, the 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 dollars, the ten dollars that were created will be there. The problem begins and ends with the with, when the so-called credit is created out of nothing, and that's the, that's the biggest problem. And, and, and there's a lot of it, yeah, a lot of it. Uh, but that's, that's, that's got something to do with the uh, monetary system uh, in the Western world. 
and the fractional reserve banking that uh, the, the legislator permits banks to lend uh, without any backup. And that's, that's the tragedy. So, so, so th this is the key for boom bust cycles also, that uh, vicious cycles that are observed in the Western world and, uh, and, and going to be very soon again. We're going to have a massive bust. It's also, uh, it's also, the, uh, it also produces what we call the bubble activities. A lot of bubbles were created. And, uh, and, uh, and the moment the Fed starts to, starts to raise interest rates, uh, the, 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 the bubbles will get burst. Bursting of the bubble will occur. And, and that's where we call it a recession or depression, whatever you want to call it. But it's actually good news because the moment bubbles disappear, good guys, the ones that are creating wealth, could uh, breathe nicely, nicely. Now they can start moving ahead. That's that's the, so the bust is very good for the wealth creators, very bad for bubbles. And unfortunately, we have so many bubbles right now that, that that's why there will be um, going to be a massive noise once they're starting to uh, to, to go under. And uh, Frank, you have recently. But, but I as, okay. Go ahead, Ira. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, but as we've seen, of course, when credit gets so extended and so. Who's, who's borrowing is the least credit worthy borrowers, especially when we're at this time. And we, we, we learned this over and over again. And I think, you know, one of the things about going back to the 70s, when and everybody wants to talk about comparing this period to the 70s, when the, when the OPEC crisis hit, I'll call it the OPEC crisis, who was, who was borrowing? Um, the emerging market, or what we called back then the third world countries, who were struggling to get some economic development going, but they were paying an exorbitant amount of money for energy and, of course, food at the time. And what were they borrowing? They were borrowing from the large um, uh, banks, the global banks, who were busy, quote unquote, recycling those petrodollars, uh, or that's what we wanted to call them. So they were taking those and they were and the emerging markets were the least credible borrowers because they weren't they were just borrowing to stay in place and yet the cost of that borrowing went up enormously so that's not the situation i don't think we're in now but the borrowing numbers are so much more inflated because central bank activity has been so much more inflated and so much monetary uh stimulus provided into the system that again Who's left to borrow, but the least credit, you know, if you've got money to lend, quality bar, potential quality borrowers with, well, they don't need the money. Apple doesn't need the money, yet they borrow anyway. Uh, Microsoft doesn't need the money. Who needs the money? The least credible. And, and I think that's where the system builds in its fragility, especially in a fiat currency world. Yeah, look, you know, you see, uh, the, the, uh, I, I don't have any problems with what you're saying. In other words, what the, the, situ what the system we have at present, as I mentioned, we have the, uh, the banks, the banks don't have to pursue any prudent conservative policy today. If, if anyone approaches them uh, for, for a loan, they will give you, right? They will give you and they, they, no, no questions asked. Uh, but be, because they do know the banks uh, well aware, that, and if they're quite large, the, the, the Fed or the central bank will, will not allow them to go under. Occasionally, the banks, the central bank uh, allow such things, but very rarely. So, so, so we, we are in a situation where the current monetary system, uh, which you can call it a central bank, which is a, a guide, which is a, uh, surrounded by banks, now the central bank's banking, uh, is, is, is approaching the state of bankruptcy. And I, and I personally don't think such a system can, can last for too long now. Uh, and, and that's why we need as fast as possible the introduction of the gold standard, although it will not happen just like that because, because people like, like Bernanke himself and the current uh, Fed chairman and all the other mainstream economies and and uh, and the government economies, they hate gold. Why they why they hate it? They understand exactly 
that gold will prevent the government from manipulating things. Gold is a discipline because you cannot print money on a gold standard, right? But uh, you can abuse it. And this was done uh, in the 19th century. You know, it, it, it can be done because then instead of saying that uh, the money the issuing, issuing will be backed up 100% uh, by gold, they can say it will be backed up by 80% of by gold, 50%, um, 10%. In other words, they can always uh, they can always abuse it, right? But if they were to follow uh, honest policy, a proper gold standard, then this is the only solution because then it will prevent central banks from manipulating money supply, playing with interest rates, all that will go. And then whatever interest you will see, that's what the market really wants. Uh, the whatever money supply you see, that will be part of the uh, amount of, of amount of gold in the system and and no, nobody needs to print money right and but uh, the 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 people like Bernanke and all the other guys they believe that, uh, that, that this is exactly weakness of the gold standard because it doesn't allow the central bankers to manipulate money supply and that's precisely the strength right but they they perceive it as a weakness because they believe that they somehow know how to how to manipulate the economy. They can only destroy the economy, not not nothing else. So let, let me ask you one question. I know Richard. I'm, so no, no. Dr. Shostak, if I follow and I and I believe I do follow because I find it interesting. I, here, I, I know you didn't mention them, but I have sitting next to me at all times because I I read Schumpeter's essays. I don't know whether you're a fan of yeah, Schumpeter. Well, I'm, I'm familiar with Schumpeter. Yeah, I, I, I don't always like him, but I, I, I know, I know he, he's he wrote many political trees as much as economic trees. But yeah. if I if I adhered to a gold standard, would it would I be able to basically prevent the widespread use of wars because I really couldn't finance them in any real way, right? Unless the world goes to war, but just to ramp up military spending, it would it would limit my ability to build up what, you know, in the United States, what we call, of course, a military industrial complex, because there'd have to be much more discipline in our borrowing. Yeah, look, you see, you see, the, the, then once we'll have a, a proper gold standard, uh, we're most likely going to have proper economics. In what sense? That the decision maker would have to decide whether he wants to spend more on arms and less on bread and vice versa. In other words, if a, if a policymaker will decide, the president will decide, we need a stronger army, okay, we have to fund it. Now, we'll raise taxes, right? And people will have less money for something else. But it, it cannot happen by, by defrauding people, by printing money and telling them everything is, is okay. Whilst in the, in the future, all of a sudden, prices will start going up and nobody will be able to explain why it's happened because they, they don't try to explain. They're covering it up all the time. Uh, today, if you listen to the uh, top guys in America or anyone, uh, Larry Summers, for instance, for, former uh, Treasury Secretary, what does he say? He says basically that the reason for a higher pr prices in America are, you know, perhaps greedy businesses, perhaps uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, so-called demographic problems, but they never said the one word, money supply. They, they, they don't say it because the moment they will say it, they will have to accept that they are to be to blame for it, for, for the so-called, what they call inflation. So Mises and Rosbach, uh, they define inflation, not changes in, con in the consumer price index or increases in prices. They define inflation as increases in the money supply. That's really what inflation is. And if you look at the, uh, the old dictionaries, Webster dictionary or, or any other 19th century dictionary, even the early 20th century, they would say inflation is excessive increase in money supply. The, 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 this is all what it is. And uh, the moment you define inflation as increase in money supply, you can say immediately that, uh, or you can ascertain the damage that it, it causes. Number one, because when money is used in transaction, 
properly, it basically helps you to exchange something for something. Now, you exchange something for money and money for something else, something for something. But whenever you print money, it's like a counterfeiter effect. You're producing nothing, and then you use money to exchange for something, which means you exchange nothing for something. And nothing for something, it's embezzlement. And that happens all the time. They're, they're, they're basically the government, whoever prints money, it's a counterfeit, a counterfeit effect. They divert wealth from wealth generators towards all the embezzlers. And that's what we have right now in the Western world or everywhere. And that's, that's a terrible thing. And that's why eventually the, the so-called store of wealth or the tank of wealth or the kitty is getting empty. And then the bank manager phones you and say, Mr. X, your bank account is finished. There's nothing left there. And that's really where we are right now, unfortunately. Various other symptoms are just uh, beside the point because they, you can have all sorts of symptoms. And the, the fact that they're playing with interest rates, it's even worse. You know, they're saying uh, we need to raise the interest rate to the level that Volcker did, Paul Volcker. And they're praising Paul Volcker. But Paul Volcker hasn't done a good policy at all. He killed the economy. It took many, many years before there was some a reasonable recovery in the American economy. And uh, you've recently written uh, an article on the Fed's tightening will only drag out the economic slump. Uh, Frank, right. can you elaborate a bit more on that, what your thoughts are? Yeah, very, very easy. I mean, well, I, I hope so it's easy. Uh, basically, j just, uh, just uh, you know, uh, as, as I mentioned, that uh, printing money what it does, the damage, the main damage, it, uh, it, and, and it's like anybody who holds new printed money is in a position to take without giving anything in return. It's like a counterfeiter. It's like a thief, le legalized stealing. And uh, so, so, so what is happening when, when the central bank enacts tight interest rate policy, it doesn't really fight the, the counterfeiter. What it does, it raises interest rates. It basically messes up with uh, market signals because interest rates are like a traffic lights. It, it, it tells the businesses uh, how much to allocate today and how much tomorrow, right? So that's like any price, like price of bread, pr price of sugar, whatever, right? And so, uh, it, so you should allow uh, the, the wheels of the people to be expressed correctly in the market. Otherwise, businesses will, have, will make uh, massive errors. But uh, so the central bank comes and says, okay, we got a problem now, prices are going higher. So, so what we're gonna do, we're, gonna, we're going to cool off the economy. How they're cooling off? By raising interest rates. So they're creating uh, two issues here. Number one, by raising interest rate, the killing of the, the so-called bubble activities, they're the, the, the getting affected because they'll get now less lending. But the other damage, damaging effect uh, is on the wealth generators. Now, wealth generators can, will not be able to pick up the correct signals. So they will generate a wrong, wrong production, productive structure, wrong, wrong infrastructure which sometimes in the future they'll, uh, they'll discover it's not profitable. So basically, we, uh, they generate uh, a terrible mess. They're killing the bubbles, which is fine, but they're also killing the good guys, which is bad. And therefore, the economy is, is really in a, a, will remain in a, in a so-called depressionary state for a long time because of the good guys, because the good guys will be damaged. Uh, and uh, and what, what's even more, uh, after uh, it will, it may take a long time before the wealth create generators will be able, despite the bad, bad government policies, to overcome all that and start to uh, build up the the wealth wealth generation. Now, uh, you you can use uh, the following analogy, which is, could be very easy uh, easy to follow. Imagine an individual who was attacked by parasite from outside parasite, like an insect. And this insect is like it sucks your blood and it basically weakens you. So what do you do uh, to, to get rid of this parasite? You just go and get rid of it. You just kill it and that's it. 
and and then you'll be fine. But what the guy, what, but the other way of doing this is not to attack the parasite, but attack the the, the human being, give him some pills, uh, all sorts of stuff, and this guy will take the pills and will get weak, weaker and weaker and weaker until God forbid they can even die. And that's really the interest rate policy. Instead of attacking, instead of attacking the 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 culprit of the problem, too much money was created. Close the loopholes for creation of money. Don't don't print any more money. Uh, don't, don't monetize budget deficits. Don't allow banks to lend uh, uh, unbacked lending without savings. Then of course you you're going to close the loopholes and the and the, paras the, the and the parasites will disappear, and the good guys will be able to breathe. Breathe greatly, and they will, and everything will, uh, and and the recovery will will take place. And in fact, it it could move very fast because businesses know exactly what to, what to do and how to do. But uh, but the government bureaucrats haven't got a clue, and that's what we call socialism and free market. Right now, we in America is almost socialism. Interesting. And your thoughts, Ira? Well, I can't disagree with the with the thing, and now, but then it brings us to, of course, what's the economic thought that's running around today with the modern monetary theorists, which is you know you can fund everything, but it depends. It relies on a responsible electorate to raise taxes on itself, but we know that that's not necessary because the government, uh, with the help of the central bank. Is always willing to fund itself, you know, and I and I love the fallback position, and and I've heard it directly from Jerome Powell's mouth before he was Fed chair, was that don't worry. When I asked him a question one day, I was at a symposium, and I asked him a question: Who guarantees the European Central Bank? And his response was, "You don't have to worry; they have a printing press." Well, it, <laughs> it's that mindset, you know. I. I I can tell you the date, it sticks to my mind. That was the mindset. And that's the mindset that continues this. You know, of course, you know, you're certainly an economic historian. So we know going back to the 60s that it was Lyndon Johnson funding guns and butter, as they say, right? There was no, when, he, when, he, when they talked about a tax increase in 1965, not going to happen, or 1967, because you don't win elections raising taxes. So when I see modern monetary theory and it and its bottom line is dependent upon a quote unquote responsible electorate who is willing to raise taxes on itself to slow the economy down and bring budgets back to some type of uh, sanity, it's not going to happen. It's it's you may as well chase you know. Um, um, unicorns and uh, fairies and everything else, because it's just not going to happen. So I, I love I love to hear Dr. Shostak on that well, because no, I think it's so important. Yeah, you see the the MMT that you mentioned, it's a it's a shocking type of theory, you know, like it's a, it's a really it's basically denies uh, the existence of 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 scarcity. I mean, we don't we live in a abundant world. And the, the government can do anything, right? This is just uh, to me, it's a, a pure nonsense. But uh, the 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 sad the sad part of all that that uh, people saying, okay, I I want to build a project, uh, massive project uh, next to New York uh, to build a pyramid, and I need to fund it. So now for 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 me for Mises for the other guys, conservative guys. Funding means you have to have the resources, you have to have the savings. Somebody, like any individual, if you want to have say, you're using your savings for rainy days, and then you're using them to feed yourself, right? Uh, here they're saying, no, no, no problems. All you have to do is just uh, print, and, and printing will, uh, will, be, be, will be exactly like savings. This is, uh, this is utter nonsense because the money is just good for, for one thing, to be a medium of exchange. Uh, you don't need more of it because if you have too much of it, you just uh, the, 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 the dilute the value of the purchasing power of money and everybody will, get, will, be, get, will be much worse. 
So, so the the ultimate story here that people should be able to distinguish between savings, which is the real stuff, real stuff, and uh, and non and and the printing money. Now, just to give an example of real savings, if you have produced your, let's say, and I'm using this example uh, of a baker. So baker has produced 10 loaves of bread, consumed by himself two loaves of bread. So he has saved eight loaves of bread. And those eight loaves of bread are very real. And he can use those real said, uh, said bread to, 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 to use it to expand his uh, oven, to maintain his oven, so, but he will need to uh, hire a technician for that. And he's gonna pay him with bread. But if he doesn't, if he didn't save anything, he won't be able to hire the technician. He won't be able to do anything, right? He won't be able to maintain this oven either. So the whole thing will fall apart. And that's really, uh, we are at this particular juncture right now that we don't have savings. we got a lot of money. Yeah, but it's got nothing to do with savings. You need the real savings. You need apples, potatoes, tomatoes. Somebody has to produce final consumer goods. And, uh, and and this is not this is not this is not on the agenda of of Mr. Jerome Powell or Ben Bernanke or all the other bureaucrats. In your thoughts, Ira? I'm I, now I'm going to stop there because there's nothing more I could say. I, I think that I think that's right. And because we're on with the Financial Repression Authority, this is the basis of it. Because again. Somebody is always going to pay the price. If I'm financially re repressing somebody, and I believe right now the most financially repressed people in the world are the Germans, and it gets covered over because you know it's now: am I a good member? Am I a good European or am I a good German? But the Germans are paying a very steep price for belonging to the. European Union. Now, other people will say, well, they're getting a benefit because they get a benefit of a weaker euro in order to export more. Well, we're seeing the, the, their trade numbers are dissipating dramatically, even with a weaker euro. So that's not true. So all they're really doing is getting financially pressed because anytime you financially press somebody, somebody's getting rewarded. So as Dr. Shostak said, you know, they're the frauds. They're the embezzlers in the system. Now you can embezzle many ways. And by the way that we reward borrowers at the expense of savers, we have done this. This is the basis of American capitalism, I think over the last 60 years. We, we call it capitalism, but I believe we should call it debtism yes, because the introduction of credit cards and the ability to keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing in the hope of being able to pay it back. And the fact that then we deduct those interest expenses, right? We pay taxes on savings while we deduct interest on it. We, we, de we, de we de deduct the expense of interest costs. Think about that. We're not capitalism, we're debtism. Debt is, debt is rewarded. And therefore, when you reward that, when you, excuse me for my language, but when you set a policy, somebody always gets screwed. You know, and if you don't have enough power, you know, it's like Russell Long, the U.S. Senator from Louisiana, used, you know, when he, he used to say when he was the head of the uh, the um, the uh, Senate Finance Committee, that when all the lobbyists would come, you know, they would all ask for benefits. And so he had a little poem that he would recite. Don't tax him and don't tax me. Tax the one behind the tree. <laughs> and that's how the financial system works. Who's behind the tree and who's getting screwed? I'm I can tell you honestly, I went to my bank last week and I said, well, I have all this money in my account because I want to remain liquid. I want to, I said, don't you think you should raise the rate on my savings to 2%? And they started laughing. I mean, I'm not close to 2% and that's shame on me when I take more money out and I buy T-bills and I buy other things that keep me short term that are liquid, but it, but that's what they're doing. And so anybody who has savings in this country, and that's, you know, to go back to Dr. Shostak's words, you're betting, you're so penalized. You're so penalized, but they reward you for that. Because again, you get to, you get to write down 
uh, your debt expense uh, on your tax return. So you're, yeah. it's a deduction. You see, in the, 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 the policy of the, cent, of the Fed, of the government, and everywhere in the world, including the United States, uh, are anti-savings. And it emanates from a, a famous gentleman, uh, Mr. John Maynard Keynes. His ideas are, are dominating the scene all the time, and we're suffering because of his crazy ideas, because for him, savings was not spending. So everything, everything is driven in, on, on, in his way of thinking through increase in demand. In other words, demand creates supply. He stood up against the famous sales law, the, the, the uh, Jean-Baptiste Say, famous French economist, the great economist. And, uh, and he came and st- said to everybody, I have refuted the, the law, the, the classicals, by refuting the sales law. Forget about classicals. And this, the economics begins with me. And that's really the tragedy where we are right now. Because if you have a problem, let's boost the demand. Let, 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 take, for instance, a, a famous Harvard economist, Gregory Mankiw. You probably heard his name, right? Mm-hmm. So Gregory oh, Mankiw, oh. one of the, I remember, not, not, not this time around, but uh, in previous episodes, was saying the solution should be boost, boosting the demand and through the Keynesian multiplier, everything will just move. Uh, likewise, Mr. Uh, Paul Krugman, he, he, he is polluting the, the whole e- economic environment with the, the ideas that there are, there are no bubbles here. C- C- central bank does not create bubbles. Everything is fine. The interest rates mu- must be low because that's he said it so. so. And that's how it works. So, uh, so the layman, uh, hasn't got a clue about the, 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 the complexity of what they say. Uh, they're covering the, 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 the nonsense with mathematical formulas to appear to be scientific. And then, of course, when you look at this, the uh, normal guy looks at it and said, hey, those guys are very smart. I'm not in a position to, 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 to evaluate them even. And therefore, I accept what they're saying. And uh, if they say that we got plenty of savings because central bank can print savings, so be it. And that's, that's where, where we are right now. Uh, we, we ran out of savings. Uh, the American economy is bankrupt, virtually bankrupt, I would say. And, uh, you know, and uh, just, just think about it, that they have, uh, by February this year, one of the measure of money that we're using jumped 80% year on year, February this year. This, this, this is an unprecedented increase. Now, this is like a nuclear device explosion. And this, this created all the havoc we see right now. And this, is, this happened everywhere in the world, not only in the, in, the, in the United States, everywhere. And that's why most people, most people in, in, Western, in the Western world are protesting, but they don't understand against what they're protesting. They should be go, going and protesting against the central banks. They should go attack the central banks. But they're attacking the the wrong enemy. They're attacking, they're attacking the businesses. Elizabeth Warren, the famous American politician, what did, what did she say? She said that that the reason why we got high inflation in America because of the of the businesses gouging prices. You know that's what she was saying, Elizabeth Warren, right? Yeah. She she uses businesses for causing inflation. Unbelievable, but that's that's how it works. And the next step, what we'll have in America, uh, price controls, similar to what we had in the Soviet Union. And then it will be total disaster. And that's really what they're aiming at. Yeah, you've mentioned that recently, Ira, right, on the price. Yeah, cut. yeah. I, I, people laughed at me. I said about three, four months ago that... Over the summer, we would probably see, first I said price and wage controls. And one of my blog readers said, not with this administration, there'll be no wage controls, but there will be price controls, you know, a possibility. And I think that's that's absolutely right. And it'll, of course, we're, that will bring us back to the 70s because it'll be food and energy, because food is a very serious issue in the world right now. You know, and, and, and I don't know why they're sitting on their hands or there's ways that they can maneuver around Putin if they wanted to, 
and they don't even use their own money. They can use they can use the gold. They can use the gold at the IMF to do this, right? Because why why does it, is a Keynesian based organization like the IMF, which is it, it's a it's a total tribute to Keynes on a gold. Why do they hoard gold so much? And I know I know the the uh, the articles of, of governance at the at the IMF, but they sit on two hundred and fifty billion dollars of gold. Why aren't they using that gold? They should be issuing IMF gold backed bonds. 20, 20, okay, you want to use twenty percent of the of the value of gold? I'd buy those bonds in a minute, just like you started talking about at the beginning. They could do this. And not even have to use any single government's money is uh, there's no thought process. But yeah, you see, you see, the, the the reason why they're hoarding gold. This is just historical historical thing, you know. But the, the the guys who run the IMF haven't got the clue about not the gold standard, not about the proper economics. They just ignore uh, ign ignoramuses, really, you know. <laughs> and uh, to me, uh, most of the uh, leaders of the central banks worldwide, they haven't got the clue what they're saying, actually. They, they, they don't understand anything. And so, so you know, so, so they're having gold. Why, uh, why in America, you know, this Fort Knox, they keep so much gold? They, they, it's historical stuff, right? But, uh, but they wouldn't like, to, like you to have gold, for instance, to hold gold. And uh, that's what uh, Roosevelt did in, in the 30s, right? right. He introduced the, the legislation against holding gold. The, the, this was con gold confiscation, you know. So we are America is heading towards some kind of a socialism, a former Soviet Union. That's what will happen. That's that's the United States of America, and the free market that built made America great uh, gradually disappears, and that's the tragedy. The the only thing which keeps America going is the so-called constitution, but every president. Uh, bypasses the constitution and the, uh, and it becomes a joke. There's no more constitution as such. And that's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. And just a, a final question or topic of discussion mm -hmm. on your firm uh, AAS Economics for applying Austrian economics. Um, there's an approach of using systematic portfolios uh, to, to identify those those portfolios. Can, can you elaborate a bit more on that? Um, how how that process is done, and and what the uh, the trends are indicating in terms of investments and trends currently and for the next six to twelve months. Yeah, well, put it this way: we 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 have developed our own uh, monetary metric. Uh, we don't really use the money supply official money supply. We modify the official money supply uh, for uh, in, in, in line with ideas of Mises, Mises mostly not Rosbach. And uh, in other words, we are interested to know the amount of money. In other words, uh, for us, uh, saving deposits are not part of money. Saving deposits, it's like lending. We call it credit transaction. And, the, and money we call like demand deposit, that's really the claim transaction. So we're building, as we, we have built our own monetary indicator. And then we, we following the, the monetary indicator, we establishing the uh, cyclical, cyclicality of this uh, monetary growth, if you want. And we break the uh, cycles, the monetary cycles into four phases. Uh, phase number one, two, three, and four. In the first phase, uh, the economy, so-called economy, uh, is de deteriorating at a rapid pace. In the second phase, second stage, it still de de deteriorates, but at a slow phase. Now that the, the second derivative is getting positive. And the third phase, we are already really roaring ahead. And the fourth phase, uh, stage, where the uh, rate of expansion is slowing down. So these are the four, four phases we have. And then uh, we once we identify the phases, we're saying, all right, and we're doing this for every, uh, many countries. Uh, we uh, try to ascertain the best, historically speaking, 
the combination of assets that did, did the most or produced the best return during each phase. And that's basically where it ends, it begins and ends. And obviously we got a little bit of various uh, playing around. And uh, for those people who want sharp ratios and all this nonsense, we, we provide all that, right? So we, we got people that uh, are doing all that, but we definitely don't look at the way the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, traditional portfolio theory, uh, the so-called Markowitz portfolio framework, they're looking at risk reward. In other words, they're saying that if uh, you assume higher risk, you'll get more reward. We reckon this is gambling. This is not investment, right? So we, we uh, our approach is more of a, a la Warren Buffett, if you want. We're saying that businesses uh, that are not are not persuaded or not driven by risks. Risk as such, they're driven by profit. If they can make a profit, that's where the where how they're gonna look, uh, how they're gonna follow this. So uh, risk is uh, at the moment you start starting to talk as the conventional guy saying risk reward. Uh, you you're basically dealing with casino gambling etc. We don't deal well. Like, we actually want to establish uh, properly what's what's going what's the uh, what's the right asset should be and the quality of asset etc. etc. So we got the people people were doing this, but that's the in a nutshell. Uh, in other words, it's anti Markowitz framework, anti uh, so-called diversification for sake of diversification. We don't believe. To diversify, the diversification is the right approach at all, right? Uh, it happens that after you build the portfolio, it would appear to be diversified, but we don't really have a goal to diversify, right? That's that's uh, silly, but that's really how most American portfolio managers are, are operating. For instance, I'll give you an example. Uh, in the 90s, I had a phone call from uh, one uh, American uh, fund manager and says to me, are you, are you familiar with this company? He says to me, in Egypt, some kind of a name. I said, no. So I said, uh, so, so why are you interested in the Egyptian company? He said, because, uh, because it, it, it appears to me that it could minimize my standard deviation. And therefore, in, in overall portfolio, I'll have a greater reward for less risk. And I looked at him and I sort of said to him, look, I didn't tell him that this is, this is pure nonsense to operate like that, but that's really how they operate. And they, they, that's the way, that's why uh, you would find that many, many, many organizations run massive portfolios with thousands, I don't know, assets there, and nobody in a position even to understand, to evaluate the, the type of assets they're holding. Because the, the, the idea is risk reward, risk reward. And and currently are the systematic portfolios indicating any investment asset classes or, or trends thereof on yeah, like for instance, we we hold that uh, the America is moving towards uh, a difficult phase, right? Which means that uh, I, I do agree with this. Some of the mainstream they say more defensive, but when they say more defensive, something that you can really, uh, first of all, accommodate uh, people's basic needs. First of all, right? Uh, we 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 hold that the uh, long-term yields, for instance, uh, are likely to, to trend upward, although there will be oscillations around the uptrend because because of the central bank interference. We don't share the view that central banks determine interest rates, they distort interest rates. In our books, interest rates are determined by individuals, by the, what we call the time preferences. So if you, uh, if you uh, take a poor individual, he, he, he will not agree to lend any of his resources. So in other words, his interest will be extremely high, but if you, if his wealth will start to expand, then obviously it will land at the, at the lower rates. And that's the reason why when we observe that wealth is undermined and, and getting hammered because of the bad policies, uh, rates are going higher. It's not because of the so, so what they call inflation, right? No, uh, the in, increase in money supply causes rising prices 
and undermines wealth, wealth generation. And this is such uh, pushes the individual's time preferences higher. And, uh, but it, it, it appears as if inflation pushes uh, rates higher, not. That this is just a result. In other words, what we are saying again, that uh, we don't derive our results from correlations as most people on Wall Street are doing, but we, we try to understand uh, or we try to use uh, sound theory, if you want. Mm -hmm. So if it, uh, so in other words, we have a theory and then we explain with the theory, the data, not other way around. We don't create theory from the data. Interesting. And your thoughts, Ira, on the... Uh, no, I, I, you know, and I didn't, I really don't know of his group, but, but I will follow them now because that's so much of the way I see the world. And people who read my stuff and have listened to me, I always start with a top-down view. I don't go bottom up. I'm, I'm not a good enough accountant. I'm not, a, I, 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 you know, I dropped out of accounting freshman year to go into uh, political science and economics and learn political economy because I, the micro didn't really do much for me. But if I look around the world and I see a view or I look in a glow, in a more macro sense, I can find my way to exactly what Dr. Shostak talks about. It's like when I, when um, Louis Gavay and I, and again with Mark Faber, and we talked about back, you know, 2020 and 21, 2021, what the world was going to need. You were going to need food. Agriculture companies were quality companies. Yes, they had taken on too much debt, but they were growing their way out of debt. Same with mining companies. Now they won't always be good, but people need these things. And as long as the, the global world itself is growing and becoming more middle class, there will be opportunities. But I happen to agree, you, you can build models to get whatever you want. It, but if I don't know the assumptions in your models, they're, they're silly to me anyway. You know, I, absolutely, again, absolutely I've, right. I fought against the Phillips curve ever since I've been in graduate school. It, it didn't make any sense to me. And I said, when I could finally get somebody who would admit what the assumptions were, I said, I think those are faulty assumptions. So now you see, you know, if, if you get to one plus one, you're getting two and a half, you can question this immediately. <laughs> well, I, it's funny that you say that because the, the tagline to my blog, Dr. Shastik, is from Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground. I'm a big fan of Dostoevsky, in which he says, two plus two equals five is a beautiful thing. And that's kind of how I see the world. If the world's too much in balance by the rationalists, as he calls them, I'm nervous. Because the world just is, it's just not that. I'd like yeah, to believe yeah, yeah. that. Look. Well, but the, the most important thing that uh, uh, I picked up from Mises and Rothbard and, yep. uh, and smart, smart people like Warren Buffett, for instance, yep. or Charlie Munger, uh, they're basically saying, look, you have to, if you, uh, uh, demand is unlimited, that's what Jean Baptiste says, uh, unlimited, but our means are very limited. So we have to generate means, the ability to demand, right? And to, to, to be able to demand things, you have to produce infrastructure for that. And in order to produce infrastructure, you have to have people that will build the infrastructure in, in the infrastructure. And in order to have those people, you have to feed them. You have to give them something to eat, right? So if they won't have the, the basic stuff that will keep them up, then, they, then nothing will happen, you see? And that's what we call the, the Austrians are very good at it. The, the, uh, the uh, old, old Austrians, they were saying, like this guy, famous guy, Bom Baverk. He was saying, you have to have the bottom line. If there's no bottom line, nothing will happen. And the same what Warren Buffett says. Warren Buffett comes and analyzes the company. He looks at the management. He looks at the desk. He looks what they're producing. And he says, okay, it looks, looks, looks reasonable. And then he asks himself, okay, is the product will be in demand? in 10 years time, that's it, you know? And then he forms this view. It doesn't need to do all sort of uh, high, highly sophisticated mathematics. It doesn't need such a things. It's just pure common sense. But today, common sense, it's a very scarce commodity. It doesn't exist. 
No, I, I mean, you, 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 I, I, I had a, I had a bad, not bad, it, fun experience. I, I met the guy at the, uh, like the FOMC in America, FOMC in England, Bank of England, one of the members there. And he wanted to hear what how the, this particular view we discussed right now. So I was talking to him, talking, and he's professor at London School of Economics. So he says to me, Frank, it's very interesting, but I couldn't understand one word you say. <laughs> so I said to him, hey, I said to him, dear professor, what's, what's, what exactly wasn't clear to you? He said, I couldn't really link it to any models that I know. That's what his problem, you see? Because he got a lot of models in his head and he couldn't associate with any, any one of them. And that's the problem. Well, wow, it's been very interesting, insightful discussing. Uh, and can you uh, relate to our listeners how listeners can get in touch with you or you with your work, Frank? Yeah, definitely. No, like we, we can we can help people in terms of trying to understand what's going on in the environment, uh, wh whether it's reasonable to expect a rise in interest rate or decline in interest rates. Uh, also, uh, try to expand to them the meaning of inflation, that, that th this is not rising prices. Mm -hmm. uh, people should remember that in 20s, prices were stable, whilst money supply was actually out of control because, because the, the, uh, the production was quite strong at the time. So prices didn't move. And everybody, including famous Ir Irving Fisher said, we have reached the stage where everything is hunky-dory, nothing is going to happen. Everything is great. And then a few months afterwards, the whole thing collapsed because they defined inflation as increases in prices rather than increase in money supply. And if they, if they would have looked at money supply growth, then they would conclude it quickly that massive damage occurred on the, to, to the so-called wealth generation process. Capital, capital base was decimated. And that's why the American economy or most of the Western world, world economies collapsed. Contrary to what Milton Friedman was saying. Friedman was saying the central bank failed to print money. This is the, the most disgusting type of comment. But Ben Bernanke followed this comment. And that's what he did in 2008. It pushed massive amount of money which completely destroyed everything. Well, you know, in the, fa in the famous quote from Bernanke to Friedman at Milton Friedman's 90th birthday party, yeah, yeah. when Bernanke famously said, we won't make that mistake again, right? That's, that's, right. that's what is... Uh, right. He uh, apologized, he apologized to Milton Friedman. Uh, he said, I'm, I'm so, we are sorry for making this stupid error we did in the 1920s. Yeah. Unbelievable, yeah. unbelievable. And just your, and your, your um, contact for Ira on your, um, our listeners to get in touch with your work. Yeah, notes from underground still yeah. and these podcasts. So, yeah. uh, I mean, I love doing these, here it is again. And uh, Dr. Shostak and I have more in common because my grandparents, my maternal grandparents, came from a little town outside of Riga called Krislava. Yeah, from Krislava, Lat Latvia. My mother was. Ah, Latvia. Was, uh, That's interesting because I, I was born in Latvia, Riga. I know. I know. They came from a little town called Krislava in like 1906 or 1907. Um, yeah, well. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with all this. Names. Yeah, it's a little, it's a, it's a very close to Riga. It was very close to Riga. I don't even know if it exists, but uh, my family, that's where they came from. So I was, we have a lot in common and I, and I have some, I have some Latvian artists paint that I have hanging in my house that I bought when the, mm. in 1982 and 1983 by, by again, a guy named Boss. B A U S mm -hmm. painted anti-war pictures. And I loved, 
I loved his sense of humor, you know, because we always learn, oh, the, the, the Soviet people never had a sense of humor. They had a wonderful sense of humor. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, the, the Russian people have a lot of sense of humor because that's the yeah. one. But uh, if you have, if you would have had excessive sense of humor, then during <laughs> the Stalin's time, they would send you to Gulag quickly. Yeah. Too bad, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. So this was this is again another great opportunity, and I'm and I'm so glad to be able to sit here with Dr. Shostak and talk about these things, because you know I've read Fisher, I've read Mises, I've read you know you know of course Hayek, uh, who has but th this brings it to life, and, th and this is worth everything when you can Hayek sit is a politician, is, is a diplomat. He said Hayek didn't want to upset the other guys, so he sort of tried to be nice. You know, but uh, but you know, like I I personally don't like Hayek, to be honest with you. I, I think he's yep. was, he's not Mises. Mises straightforward, and just blunt, and it and it tells you the way it is. That's yep. Rosbart much better. Rosbart yep. is the greatest of all. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk.